Welcome to St. Mark. Uh, welcome to those on our De Pere campus, our Green Bay campus, and our online campus. It is great to have you. As we continue, a series we started last weekend, um, it's entitled 20 Answers Offered. It's based on the top 20 questions Christians hope no one ever asks them, but we probably should address those, right, from a biblical standpoint. So it's great to have you join us. Tom had only seen the golf course on television. Now standing close to the first tee, he was awestruck. The shades of green in the fairway and the rough, the crystal white sands of the sand traps. Even the ball washer was impressive. Hey, pretty cool place, isn't it, Tom? Jim shouted at him as he walked toward him with the other two uh, people who were going to golf with him that day. Hey, hey, Tom, I want to introduce you to some people. This is Cindy. She is an associate professor at the college in the Department of, of Law, and she also serves as the women's golf coach. And then he smiled at uh, Tom and said, I, I just thought I'd invite her to play with us today so we could get like free lessons and free coaching. And then he looked at an older man, the guy probably somewhere in his mid-50s, early 60s, and said, hey, Tom, I want to introduce to you Paul, he is the head groundskeeper of this entire golf course and has been for over 30 years. In fact, this is the man who gave me a job when I was in high school during the summer. I worked on the grounds crew here. Oh, that explains how you got a tea time on Easter Sunday, uh, Tom said to Jim. Well, it didn't hurt. After some small talk about Easter services and brunch menu, it came time for them to tee off. The first three holes were uneventful, except for one lost ball and a three-putt on the second hole by both Jim and Tom. At some point early in their outing, uh, Paul and Tom were off to the side waiting for the people in front of them to finish the hole. Hey, hey, Tom, what are you studying to be? Paul asked. Tom answered, well, I think I'm going to get a degree in in microbiology. I think that's a broad enough field where I can get a very good paying job that will help me finally pay off some of my student loans. Oh, hey, I have a degree in biology too, Paul said. I have a master's in botany. But way back when I took my coursework and got my degree, it, it didn't cost the equivalent of a small house today. Hey, Paul, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, Paul, how do, you, how do you reconcile the fact that you're a scientist and your belief in God? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you're asking, Paul said. Tom continued, well, you know, the more I study science and the more I study the laws of nature, I think God is out of a job. One of the most difficult questions you as a Jesus follower, we as Christians often need to answer, sounds something like this. Didn't evolution or science put God out of a job? Now, whether that question comes from a family member, a a college professor, an acquaintance at work, or a student who now has some questions after science class, it it pervades uh, and just penetrates every part of our society today And that means you need to be able to answer that question because it's not going away anytime soon. I understand how it can be rather intimidating to address questions like that, especially in a climate where you have ever-increasing adamant claims of best-selling authors like the uh, anti-God evangelist Richard Dawkins, who is probably one of the most famous evolutionists right now. One time he is quoted as saying, today the theory of evolution is about as much open to doubt as the theory that the earth goes around the sun. It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. Nothing could be further from the truth. The creation-evolution debate is not really a debate about the Bible versus science 
or belief or Christianity versus science, as much as it's really a, a debate about bad science versus good science, or to be more precise, it really is science versus bad scientists who misuse science. It's not a debate between reason and belief. It's really a debate between unreasonable faith versus reasonable faith. And if you go ahead and take a look yourself and do your own study, you'll find out just who are the people that are most often using, quote, bad science with their unreasonable faith. Hey, Tom, before you, you mentioned the laws of nature, where do you think the laws of nature come from, Paul asked. Tom answered, well, the laws of nature come from proof in science. Paul smiled at Tom and said, no, no, no. Where do the laws of nature themselves come from? Tom answered, well, the laws of nature come from men who have definitively done the same experiments using the scientific method. Paul again smiled at, uh, at Tom and said, no, 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 I'm not talking about how we discover the laws of science. I'm talking about where did they come from? Gravity, electromagnetism, the positive and negative charges of the nuclear field. Where did they come from? And how come they're so consistent and precise? But before Tom could answer, Jim continued, I believe all of that points to an intellectual mind, a, a divine being behind the universe. And when you take a look at the consistency and, and precise nature of the laws of nature, it automatically points to a God who's behind all of this universe. And in fact, those laws of nature that he set up enable you and me to even do science. Hey, Tom, can you imagine if the laws of nature changed every five to ten minutes? We could never do science. Yeah, I never thought about that, Tom said. And then Paul said, that's why I believe that there is a God behind this universe, and that's why I believe that science and God are not at odds. There is a lot of, quote, bad science masquerading as real science in our culture today. Let's just remind ourselves of what science is, and there's one of the definitions that's used. Science is a method of inquiry that human beings use to discover cause and effect relationships in the universe. There are two types of causes. There is natural cause, and there is intelligent cause. An example of a natural cause would simply be a place some of you visited, right? Uh, the Grand Canyon. That's done by a natural cause. You don't have to believe in a God or a supernatural being that one day decided to come to earth and use his finger and make, went into the earth's crust and made what we know today as the Grand Canyon. We know that that was created through natural causes, water erosion. But it would take an intellectual or an intelligent cause to form the geological formation that we know as Mount Rushmore. How did the faces get on Mount Rushmore? It wasn't wind and rain erosion. It was an intelligent mind. That's why through the years, what I have learned is to make sure that I stress that to my consistency, to the best I can. Uh, that's why I've learned through the years to, to say, you know, science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. And oftentimes, those scientists aren't talking about science. They're talking about their personal biases, their faith. For the back nine holes, the foursome decided to play best ball golf. And so Paul was teamed up with Jim so they could catch up. And that meant Cindy was with Tom. And at one point, Cindy kind of turned to Tom and said, hey, I'm sorry, but I couldn't help overhear what you were talking about with Paul. You sound a lot like me when I was your age. Oh, Cindy, were you in the sciences as well? No, she replied, no. I, I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer and teach the law. But when I was your age, I struggled with evidence for God and science. 
I see, I grew up in a family that always said, science is the boogeyman. Tom replied, boy, you know, I grew up in that same kind of family. I grew up in a family that always said, trust God, trust God. Never trust science. So Cindy, tell me, what changed, Tom asked. Well, Cindy replied, well, one day I had a good friend challenge me to use my logic and my reason to go ahead and examine the evidence in this universe for God by putting God on trial. And when I examined the science and I examined the evidence, well, it led to God. What evidence are you talking about, Tom asked. Can you just give me one evidence? Cindy replied, yeah, let's, let's take the law of cause and effect. In this universe, every effect has a cause. For example, you and I are playing on a well-designed golf course. This did just, just didn't evolve over time and chance from a simple putting green. No, there's an intelligent designer behind this and someone intelligent sustaining this. So, Cindy, you don't believe in evolution, Tom asked. No, not macroevolution, Cindy reported. You see, life, from my experience, always comes from life, whether it's plant life or animal life or human life. Life always comes from life. Reason doesn't come from non-reason. Personality doesn't come from non-personality. The inanimate doesn't come from the inanimate. And as far as the fossil record goes, I don't see anything there compelling at all to have me believe that very primitive forms of life over time and chance somehow evolve into sophisticated forms of life through random mutation. That would be like us believing, Tom, that this golf cart we're using somehow evolved from my kid's scooter in the garage. And so, Tom, what I did is I just followed the evidence. And it only told me it magnified the power and wisdom of God. Personally, the evidence I like to share with people who have good questions in this area and are just struggling with the existence of God has to do with the recipe. It's the recipe of DNA. Science tells us that a primitive cell contains thousands upon thousands of bits of information that are perfectly sequenced in DNA. Now, if, how could nature, without any intelligence, actually do something like that? It, it, it can't. It couldn't clear the informational ladder that is necessary for creating first life, and then after that, subsequent life forms. Uh, those hurdles couldn't be cleared because, you see, those hurdles need to be cleared by intelligence. And intelligence always emanates or information always emanates from intelligence. And when you hear that primitive cells have uh, volumes of information, then you compare that to the millions and millions of specialized cells in the human body, and you realize this, there's an intelligent designer behind all this. That's why a professor named Dean Kenyon, a biologist from San Francisco State University, states, the new realm of molecular genetics is where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the earth. Information always emanates from intelligence. I'm going to say that again. Information always emanates from intelligence. It's little wonder that David in the Old Testament said, I praise you, Lord, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that, Full well. I simply like asking questions when I'm talking to people who are struggling in this area. Questions like, well, where did the information for, for the human cell come from? I don't belittle. I don't water down my beliefs. And I'm not trying to win an argument. I'm trying to help people who have good questions and point them to Jesus. And that's why generally I will study, I will start by pointing them to the God who created life in the very beginning, also being the God who had conquered death and made that victory apparent to the world with an empty tomb on that first Easter. 
I learned that technique, I learned that, that strategic plan from the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17. Remember what he said? The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He himself gives life to gives life and breath and everything else. For from one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. I just start with a simple gospel. Jesus, a cross, and an empty tomb. I remind them that Jesus isn't just a, he's not just a good example or a moral teacher. He claimed to be God in the flesh. When you see Jesus, you see God. You see God the Father, that's what Jesus said. And that Savior lives that perfect life in our place because God says good isn't good enough. And so he then dies on a, a Roman wooden cross because a loving God has to be a just God who deals with sin, doesn't leave it go unpunished, and also brings justice to a world of injustice. And so that forgiveness that he's won for us tells us my past does not have to be my future. I am not who I was in the past. I am who I am now in Jesus. And I receive that forgiveness and a real purpose in life. And then, to top it off, Jesus physically rises from the dead, making it apparent to the world that now because of Jesus, the coffin is as temporary as a sleeping bag. And so we can work for Jesus not fearing anything because we're simply not home yet. Now, after I've shared the simple gospel, what I will do then is I will encourage the person to do their own homework and start with the God who conquered death and then find out what he said about the origin of life. I believe, personally, it's best to start by telling people about the room Jesus has won for them in heaven rather than start with a debate in a classroom. As one Christian apologetist said, God has written two books, the Word and the world. And the former's infallible and inerrant nature requires that it must always guide our reading of the latter. Tom, how did your golf game go today? Jim asked as they were walking to the, uh, to the clubhouse. Well, well, Jim, I got a lot more than I bargained for. It was kind of an eye-opening experience for me today. And as far as my golf game, don't look at my scorecard. I need a lot of work. And then, then Tom looked at uh, Jim with a smile and said, you know, Jim, it's funny. What an, what an afternoon walk on a well-designed golf course could do for your perspective. 